Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campy, and this is a companion video. What are companion videos? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked. You see, every day on the John Campia Show, we take time for live questions, but quite often, we don't have time to get around to all the live questions that get sent in. But I want to make sure those questions get answered in a video, so I gather them up and we address them here on companion videos. So, without wasting any time, let's dive right into it. And we're going to think, start off here with Annie Green, who wrote, Do you think Cap told Peggy that he kissed her niece? Um, you know what? Cap seems to be the, the I cannot tell a lie kind of guy. So I'm going to have a feeling he did. Now remember to Peggy, that's just going to be theoretical anyway, because in that time she had never had a knee. So it's all theoretical and all that kind of nonsense. But that he probably didn't. It was probably still a little bit of an awkward conversation. But yep, he's an I, not, can, I cannot tell a lie kind of guy. So I'm going to think that he told her. All right. Eric Saul writes, hello all. Currently in line to graduate college. That's awesome, man. Congratulations. Seriously, that's amazing. Uh, then moving on to another university to pursue my career for film. Wish me luck and stay filthy. Well, first of all, Eric, the fact that you're actually not talking about what you want to do, you're actually pursuing what you want to do. That's amazing. That takes a lot of testicular fortitude. And I'm really proud of you for that. So congratulations, man. Huge achievement and best of luck on the next stage of your journey, man. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing, Eric. Okay. JB Bonifacio writes, happy birthday, the number one sweaty John Schnepp and hashtag Sansa 2020. Yeah. For those who might've missed it uh, today was John Schnepp's birthday. And uh, it's, it's a little bit more real this year. It is. And a lot of thank you to everybody who's been sending that in, not just to me, but to all the different people that knew and, and love Schnepp as well. Thank you to everybody who was sending out messages to all those people as well. So, yep, today was John Schnepp's birthday. Uh, Zen Tricks You writes, I think the original Highlander is one of the best movies of all time. Me too. Um, but the sequel, one of the worst sequels ever made. Also, Speed 2 is awful. Speed 2 is awful. But with the Highlander, it's crazy. I have the first Highlander in my top 10. Now, we all have our top 10 movies, and it seems like we all have at least one in it that everybody looks a little bit strange at. The Highlander is the one that I have in my top 10 that sometimes people will look strangely at. Them. Like, I get all the other ones. Really? The High yep, the Highlander. It just works for me on that level. I love it. But the Highlander 2 is one of the three. It's in my trinity, what I call the unholy trinity of the worst Hollywood motion pictures of all time. And that's how, so it's really weird. They got one Highlander movie in my top 10, one Highlander movie in the unholy trinity of the worst all time movies ever made. It's kind of weird. So you're not alone, man. I'm with you on that. All right. Julius Goodwin writes, um, <coughs> um, I'm really worried. Sorry. I took a sip of this earlier, but went down the wrong pipe. Ah, there we go. Uh, Julius Goodwin writes, I'm really worried about the MCU going forward. It might not uh, beat Avatar. Well, that's fine if it does or it doesn't. It probably will, but who cares if it doesn't? <clears throat> and that time travel opens up a lot of MacGuffins that are easy to exploit. I agree. I worry about the MCU. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not predicting disaster for the MCU. No, no. It's in Kevin Feige's hands. I'm sure it'll be fine. But... I hate the time travel gimmick. To me, time travel and multi-dimension are the two bottom of the barrel, laziest of lazy um, plot stuff to use. And, and I've explained many times why I find time travel and multiple dimension stuff to be the laziest of the lazy man's plot line stuff. I, I just, I don't like it. That doesn't mean that that stuff hasn't been used to great effect before. It has. It has been used to great effect before by some filmmakers. But in general, I worry about it. And I really hope that this whole, now that the Avengers have a functional time machine, and now that they have the ability to travel across multiple dimensions and create multiple realities, I really hope they close that off real fast. I hope one of the plans for one of their upcoming movies is to kill that, is to get, we've got to seal up the portal and end the multiple reality. I just hope they do that at some point, and I hope they do that soon, because I worry about it as well, Julius. All right, Marie Seifring writes, Quentin Tarantino is only 56. Do you think he... Uh, really will make his Star Trek film his last project. Thanks, John, Rob, Ashley, Ray, and Jonathan. Well, thanks for shouting out, everybody, Marie. That's really nice. Um, well, before we get to the question about will Star Trek be his final film, he's never said he's going to direct... Look, first of all, we don't even know if that Star Trek film is going to get made. And if it gets made... He's never said he'll be the one to direct it. We've always known it's a possibility, but nothing has ever said definitively that he will direct the next Star Trek film 
if they go ahead and get it made. So there's so many uh, hurdles to get over before we get to the question of, will Star Trek be the final film he directs? I mean, we don't even know if the film's getting made, and if it gets made, we don't know if he's going to direct it at, at all. I will say this. I don't believe for a second that even if he does, if Star Trek does get made and he does direct it, I don't believe for a second it'll be his last one. He's an artist. He's always going to come across another story or come up with a new story that he really has a vision for and really wants to make. I, I really don't think that he'll be done. Now, I don't know that he'll be Clint Eastwood and still directing movies into his 90s, but I think Quentin Tarantino still has a lot of filmmaking in him. He may he may feel frustrated right now. He may feel like, oh man, I've done this long enough, but he'll do another one. Remember, he's claimed he was quitting before and came back and did it again, so I think we'll see him make more films, regardless of if he does a Star Trek one or not. Uh, ben Hay Yusa writes, watch Zac Efron's Ted Bundy movie last night. I found it to be really solid. John, you're right. Zac Efron is a good actor. Great performance by him. That's the only reason I'm still going to watch that movie. Like, I was excited about the movie. Then I found out it got dumped onto Netflix. Then I heard some, media, some, some middle of the road stuff about it, which kind of sapped some of my enthusiasm. But even people who don't like this movie, Ben, are saying that Zach is tremendous in it. So I think I'm going to watch it just for that. I am an unapol I have been for years. I'm an unapologetic Zach Efron fan. I think this guy is a much better actor than people give him credit for. I think he's tremendously talented. And he doesn't always pick the right projects to be in. But he always delivers, and I'm looking forward. And, and because of that, I probably still will get around to watching this movie. All right, Chad's big, huge geek commentary writes: Over under 30 percent. One of the untitled Fox films in 2021 or 2022 is Deadpool 3. Love what uh, Jonathan is doing on the movie news feed. Yeah, Jonathan is doing great now. Look, it used to be that I would pick out the topics for the movie news feed, then I would write the script. And then I would narrate the script into an audio file. Then I would ship that audio file over to Jonathan. And then Jonathan would put together some graphics and edit it together. Well, now, Jonathan does almost everything on it. I mean, I still pick the topics. I, I pick which topics I want covered on the movie news feed. And I send him the topics. But after that, Jonathan writes the script. He does the, narr the narration himself. Which, by the way, he does great on the audio on that. And he cuts and edits the uh, the video together. I really love having movie news feed. Now, I don't know that we'll always have it. But I got to tell you, I love having it. And I think Jonathan's doing a good job. As far as the over-under on that, I'm going to take over. I think that, look, Alan Horn, the king of all the Disney studios, he said at CinemaCon that me and Rob were at, he pointed out and highlighted Deadpool a couple of times. They're clearly very bullish on Deadpool. I think there's a, I'm not saying it's automatic, but I think there's a much better chance than 30% that one of those films will be a Deadpool 3. Uh, I'm Upset writes, in your opinion, the worst film of the year so far. You know what? There, to me, there haven't been, there have been bad films this year, but not really bad films. The one that stands out to me, and maybe it's because I was quite excited about it. Maybe it's because I thought the trailers were so good. But it's Pet Cemetery. I thought Pet Cemetery was awful. So to me, that's the worst movie of the year so far. Uh, Preston Walden writes, It goes down in threes. Tim Conway, Doris Day, and P uh, Peggy Lipton, R.I.P. Yeah, I heard... You know, I didn't know whether to make the Tim Conway thing a topic on the John Campy show. Quite frankly, I don't know if a lot of you guys even knew who Tim Conway was. Like, Tim Conway, for the most part, was even before my time in many ways. But I... My parents loved Tim Conway. I used to be part of the Carol Burnett show, him and Harvey Corman, and I would watch reruns of that all the time. Tim Conway, I think there's an argument to be made. He was one of the funniest men who ever lived. Honestly, I, I think he may have been one of the funniest men who ever lived. Um, and it sucks that I, I felt, when I heard that he passed away, I thought, well, now I feel, because I haven't even thought about Tim Conway in at least a decade. And I felt bad about that afterwards. But yeah, RIP to Tim Conway and, and everybody else that we've lost this, lost this year as well. Evan Tainman. I like that name. Well done. Evan Tainman writes, The only thing that can top Avatar is Avatar 2. Well, get ready because I think Endgame's going to top it. Anyway, uh, there can be only one and thou shalt be blue. Like Robert Meyer Burnett, I am also an unapologetic Avatar lover. You know, I am not an Avatar lover, but I think it's a great movie. Like... The year it was nominated for Best Picture, I didn't think it should win Best Picture. 
But I was totally good with it getting nominated. I think it's a really great movie. Is it Dances with Wolves in Space? Yes, it is. And before you get mad at me for saying that, you know who coined that phrase? That Avatar is Dances with Wolves in Space? James Cameron is the one who made that uh, statement, which is, which is true. That's basically what it is. But it's a tremendously entertaining movie. I think it's wonderful, but I do think it's going to get passed by Endgame. I was as skeptical as anybody that it could do it before the movie came out, but I'm starting to think it is going to crawl over that uh, record line. Anyway, Preston Walden writes, Someone asked about filmmaking the other day. My advice is start small, keep building, grow, and also have patience. Keep learning and have fun. You know, the best advice I ever heard about filmmaking, because one of my advices in life that I give anybody all the time is... No matter what it is your dreams or goals are, do something every day, no matter how big or how tiny, do something every day that moves you closer towards your goals. Whether it's doing a big three-hour project or whether it's writing a single email, something that's moving you towards your goals, do something. I uh, I took this film course that actually Quentin Tarantino recommended. It's it's called a two-day film school. And it was run by this guy named Dove S.S. Simmons. So I went and took this class uh, for a couple of days. And one of the really big things he said to me, he goes, look, honestly, you know what? The question, how do I make a movie? I'll tell you how to make a movie. Seriously, this is how you make a movie. Get a camera, point it at a couple of friends, hit record. Two hours later, say cut and hit and stop recording and you've got a movie. There, you've made a movie. And as silly as it sounds, that really did put the whole filmmaking process into perspective for me. And now there's a million little things you can do to perfect things along the way, but the basics is just take a camera. You wanna get started in filmmaking, make a film. I don't care if you got $10,000. I don't care if you got $100,000. I don't care if you got $10. Take your phone, Hit record, point at some friends doing something for two hours, hit end, there, you've made your first movie. Congratulations, you made your first movie. Get started there, start somewhere, because it'll at least get the process rolling. But thanks for sharing that, Preston, I think that's great. All right, Mike Revel writes, Endgame viewing currently for Schnepp, happy birthday, Schnepp, yeah. I, again, it was a really um, bittersweet day for Robert, because you know Robert adored Schnepp. And when Robert saw Infinity War, it was at the press screening at the Disney lot with John Schnepp. So this year, at the Endgame press screening at the Disney lot, Rob came with me and we both remembered and ran into a couple of people who knew Schnepp as well, remember him being there the year before, and it really is a shame he never got to see this. But he sees it. He sees it. Uh, the Bearded One writes, The Raptors better fear the deer. Go Bucks. Here's the funny thing. I was, I was having a dinner with my brother-in-law the other night who was a collegiate, full scholarship uh, you know, U.S. basketball player. And we were talking about this, and I said, here's the thing. With the Raptors moving on to the Eastern Final, I actually think the Raptors will have a harder time against the Bucks than they would theoretically against the Golden State Warriors. Honestly, yeah, I think the, it's not that the Raptors are a better team than the Warriors. The Raptors match up better against the Warriors. I believe the Raptors win a series against the Warriors in six games. You may think I'm crazy, but watch the games they played this year. It's it, it, Golden State's the better team, but Toronto just matches up perfectly with them. And I said, I think they are going to have a harder time getting past Milwaukee than they would against Golden State. Now, I'm not going to panic since they lost game one, because remember, the Raptors also lost game one against Orlando, and they went on to win the series. But um, they're going to have a very, very hard time getting by Milwaukee. The, the Bucks are legit this year, man. They're legit. All right. Uh, the hero writes, Chris Rock and Saw might be interesting. He is dark. I agree. Listen, I was just like anybody else. When I read that news this morning, it's like, Chris Rock is going to reboot Saw? But the more I thought about it, you know what? Why not? That could be interesting. So count me on board. I'm at least very curious about it. All right. Jay Bling writes, where are we at here? Jared Bling writes, Adam Sandler should be cast as a sa- as a Saw victim as punishment for squandering Chris Rock on four quadrant pandering. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I've made fun a lot of the movie choices Adam Sandler has made over the past 10 years. Uh, I really thought he should have dedicated himself to just doing drama because he is a tremendous dramatic actor. I don't even know if he realizes how good he is at that. But uh, his comedies, yeah, not so much lately. Not so much, unfortunately. Uh, Pat Deary writes, 
John and Rob, I watch you every day. You're the best. Thank you so much, Pat. Which director do you think would make the best, most interesting Star Wars movie? Gunn, Coogler, Kenneth Branagh. It's, it's the same thing for me every time, Pat, to be honest with you. If you ever ask me which actor should play X role or which director should direct X movie, I'm always going to say it doesn't matter, as long as it's somebody who's talented. That is a very diverse group of three filmmakers. Like Gunn, Coogler, and Kenneth Branagh. I don't know if you can kind of bring up three other directors who'd be more opposite of each other, but they're all tremendous and they're all really great. I think they would all make a very different kind of Star Wars movie. So just Pat, seriously, sign me up. Sign me up for any of them. Sign me up for a movie that James Gunn directs, a Star Wars movie that James Gunn directs. Sign me up for a Star Wars movie that Ryan Coogler directs. Sign me up for a Star Wars movie that, that uh, Kenneth Branagh directs. I'm up for absolutely any of them, brother. All right, Micah T writes, uh, the Russos cut out the scene with Tony's future daughter because there wasn't an emotional connection. Would it have worked better with Black Widow? Honestly, it, it's irrelevant. I don't think it needed it. It just would have felt like another copy and paste of what they did in Infinity War. And remember, it wouldn't have really been Black Widow. Remember, the Russo brother said specifically, after Thanos snapped and saw baby Gamora, that wasn't actually Gamora. If you watch the director's commentary of Infinity War, they very specifically call it a vision of Gamora in the way station. They call it a vision of Gamora. It wasn't Gamora, nor would it have been, um, you know, Black Widow. Like some people keep making that assumption, but I keep pointing them back to, no, the Russo said that's a vision of somebody, but it's not actually them. So I think it's good that they didn't do it just to copy and paste what they did previously in Infinity War. I think it worked much better without it. Plus this movie was already over three hours. They didn't need to add in any more in my opinion. Uh, Colby Harris writes, I just got my first hot toy. Dangerous stuff, Colby. Iron Man Mark 7. Nice. And I have Thor from the first movie coming tomorrow. My God, that's nice. Then I have the Endgame Captain America pre-ordered. I'm telling you what, though. I keep telling people the reason I only have four hot toys is because I bought one and then in a blink of an eye, I had three more. They're so addicting to have. And unlike Pops that I have a ton of behind me, which are only eight to $10 each. These things are like 250 to $300 or more. And I just, I know as soon as I buy one more, I'm gonna buy like four more. And I just I gotta be careful with that, man. It's dangerous, just, so just be careful, Colby. I mean, I'm terribly envious, but just be a little bit careful. Uh, Robin Peterson writes, history fact, uh, May 16th, 1929 marks the first Academy Award. I actually mentioned that on the show this morning. It's the, the birthday of the Academy Awards. Uh, 1929 marks the first Academy Awards and the very first Oscar was awarded to the movie Wings, which uh, Robert pointed out today, starring Miss Clara Bow Swoon. Yep, that's true. And it's actually May 16th. Now, I, I was unclear. I forgot for a second this morning whether it was 29 or 39, but it was 29. So thank you for pointing that out, Robin. Appreciate that, man. All right, Jacob Silvers writes, John, what if Halle Berry's character betrays John and tries to kill him? Just a theory. What if Halle Berry's character betrays John and tries to kill him? Then Halle Berry's character betrays John and tries to kill him. Guys, again, you guys have been great about this lately, by the way, because I used to get what if questions all the time and now you guys do them perfectly most of the time. Jacob, so here's the thing. If you're gonna write in a what if question, make sure there's actually a question. So if you're gonna say, what if Halle Berry's character betrays John and tries to kill him, do you think that would be a good character arc for Halle Berry? Or say, if what if Halle Berry's character betrays John and tries to kill him, do you think that would make the audience upset? Like, if you're gonna start off a question with what if, make sure there's an actual question attached. Otherwise, I don't know what it is you're asking specifically or what you're looking for. And I wanna make sure if you're gonna send in a question that you get the answer you're looking for. So just keep an eye on that moving forward. All right. Uh, sh uh, Shamantha, I like that, writes, Rob, the real question is, is Godzuki in Godzilla, King of the Monsters? I've wondered that myself. Godzilla, bum, bum, bum. Remember the old kid show? Godzilla, bum, bum, bum. And Godzuki, ba, 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 ba. Remember Godzuki? If you have, don't remember Godzuki, go look up Godzuki. I'm gonna, I haven't seen the movie yet myself. I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that Godzuki is not in the new Godzilla movie. That's just my guess. All right, Cinema Survey Troy writes, oh, oh, a what if question. <laughs> see, Cinema Survey, you noticed that there was a what if question. Uh, Josh Banag writes, um, bought and watched 
The Death of Superman Lives What Happened. This, of course, John Schnepp's film uh, last night. I met Schnepp at a con before he passed. Happy birthday, man. We miss you. And, and this is a great opportunity. Thank you, Josh, for opening up this door for me. Great opportunity to plug The Death of Superman Lives What Happened. If you guys haven't seen The Death of Superman uh, Lives What Happened, it is a passion project that uh, Schnepp and uh, his partner, Holly, made together. They spent years. I was there the whole way. I mean, I remember when, when I, me and John were having lunch and he was telling me about this idea uh, for this documentary he wanted to do. <clears throat> Pardon me. For this documentary he wanted to do. And uh, they put years of themselves into that movie. John and Holly put years of themselves into that movie. And I think what they accomplished was wonderful. And I remember even the Stars Network licensed it and all this kind of stuff. If you haven't seen The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, make sure you go check it out. I think you're going to enjoy it. All right. Uh, let's see here. Where, do, where, where am I at? I missed something. Okay, there we go. James Argenta writes, CW crossover is going to be five parts of two quarters. CW crossover is going to be five parts of two quarters. I don't know what that means. Sorry, James. I went, that's gone a little bit over my head. Sorry, brother. All right, Dennis Haina writes, uh, do you see any ethical issues with using A-list to buy endgame tickets simply to add to the box office, even if I don't watch the movie? Yes. There's, a, there's several major ethical problems with that. Number one, you're contributing to fake numbers. Because look, as much as I like endgame and I'm cheering for it to beat the Avatar record, it should beat it clean, not fake. And stuff like that, and people like, to me, people organizing, hey everybody, let's go see Endgame again, because we just naturally wanna go see it. No, let's go see Endgame again so we can help it beat the record. That to me is delegitimizing the record. Stuff like this, and, and I applaud you for asking about this, Dennis. Uh, stuff like that is fake. It's artificially, which delegitimizes the record at all. So yeah, but on top of that, there's other ethical problems with it as well. Number one, you're abusing the A-list system. You're violating the terms of use of, of your A-list membership. And on top of that, let's for argument's sake, the movie's still making a lot of money. So that means there are sold out theaters. Like you, you could be booking a seat that somebody else could have got, but they couldn't because you booked it as a fake artificial thing. So, and by the way, you do that enough times because AMC knows if you show up to the movie or not because they scan you, right? So they know if you show up to these movies or not. So if you keep doing that, you're going to be in danger of getting your A-list canceled. So there are multiple reasons, Dennis, why I think that is a bad idea. It's, it's dirty. It delegitimizes uh, any record. It makes it fake. You're violating your terms of use on the thing. So yeah, there, uh, actually, Dennis, and again, I applaud you for asking and not just doing it. There are multiple ways that that's kind of unethical and and you could lose end up losing your A-list if you do stuff like that. So be very careful with that. I'd say don't do that. Uh, Seb Marvel writes, do you think Tony will be able to return in any future movie? Absolutely, 100%. I have zero doubt. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year, maybe not in three years. Hell, maybe not in five. Tony will be back. There will be a, whether it's in a leading role or not, we are going to see Robert Downey Jr. back in the MCU again, I guarantee it. Again, maybe not this year, maybe not in three years, it'll happen, it'll happen. You keep your eyes open, it'll happen. Uh, Chad's Big Huge Geek Commentary writes, Obrin, you, you will obey your queen, the mountain, uh, Precaris. I don't, I don't think her hand's name was Obrin. It wasn't Obrin the, um, the Viper? Wasn't Oberyn the Viper? Um, so I don't think, but I love that scene. I love that scene. By the way, I don't give a crap if there are some people out there who don't like this thing. Everybody's entitled to it. It's all subjective. If you don't like it, that's great. I think this season of Game of Thrones has been fan-fucking-tastic. I think it's been incredible. I am not a hardcore Game of Thrones fan. I don't know the lineages of all the houses. I don't, I've never read the books. I never will. I don't care. I'm just an average guy who watches TV and I've been watching this show and I've, I've been riveted every single freaking episode, absolutely riveted. And uh, I love it. I love it. But again, I, I could be wrong, but I think Oberyn was the, the Viper's name. Anyway, that's just my thought. Okay. Uh, the hero writes, do you think the MCU is setting up MCU's alternates to give themselves room when introducing new stories, characters, easier to forget, room for risks. The thing is, to me, it's all pretend. That's, that's why this multidimensional stuff is garbage. Because it removes any consequences of anything. 
It removes any consequences for anything. And yeah, I I really hope they don't do that. Because to me, that's lazy. It's really lazy. And I got to believe that Kevin Feige is smarter than that. And I got to believe Kevin Feige is better than that. So I, it's possible. What you're suggesting there is not out of the realm of possibility. It is possible. I just really hope it's not what they're doing. I really hope not. All right. Eric Huffman writes, MCU, Fantastic Four, Scott Pilgrim, Snowpiercer, The Losers, all Chris Evans films. Uh, is Chris Evans a lock for the Mount Rushmore of comic book movies? No. Um, first of all, everybody tries to forget those Fantastic Four movies. Not a lot of people saw Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, unfortunately. It's great. And his role was pretty damn small in it. Uh, Snowpiercer, most people still haven't seen Snowpiercer. The Loser, I love The Losers, but again, most people haven't seen it. The one thing you got from him is Cap. Um, is Captain America. That's the one real thing you've got going for you. Does that put him on the Mount Rushmore? I don't know. On the Mount Rushmore right now, I think you've got to have, where, first of all, three spots are already for sure booked and reserved in my opinion. One is Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. That That's, to me, that's a, that's a non-debate. That's not even up for vote. Hugh Jackman as Wolverine played the character for however many years. His X-Men movie was the one that got the new age of comic book movies going. Became iconic in the role despite the fact that nobody wanted him at first. He became completely iconic in it. I think Hugh Jackman goes up there. Next, you got to talk about Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. I mean, the Iron Man movie under Jon Favreau got the whole MCU rolling, all that kind of stuff. He's been iconic in these things. He's been tremendous as Tony Stark, kind of defining, helping define what the MCU was. You got to put him up there. Although you can make an argument that there have only been two proper films with him, and I say two proper because we're not going to count X-Men Origins Wolverine. I think you got to put Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool up there. I, I mean, I can't think of any guy that more defined the character they were playing than Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool. Now, granted, compared to Hugh Jackman and Robert Downey Jr., he's played that role a lot fewer times, but I think that's, to me, that's a no-brainer. I think him as Deadpool goes right up there. That leaves one spot. That leaves one spot. There's going to be a lot of arguing that Christopher Reeve as Superman deserves that fourth spot. Hard to argue against that. I think an argument can be made for Chris Evans as Captain America. He's my favorite MCU character. Not my favorite comic book character. Not even in my top 20. But in the MCU, he's my favorite character. So I think you got an argument for him in there. Um, yeah, so it... Huh. Then some say, what about Villainous? What about Jack as Joker? What about Heath as Joker? I mean, Heath was only in the one movie, but he won an Academy Award for that, for that performance, maybe that. So I believe three spots are locked and that's Hugh, that's Robert, and that's Ryan. I think those three spots are locked. And then there's room for one more. I think, although there are multiple contenders, I think it comes down to one of two. And I think it's either maybe Chris Evans or it's Christopher Reeve. Tough, it's tough. But I, but I wouldn't say he's a lock because I think that's a close debate between, uh, between Christopher Reeve and him. Who do you guys say get that final spot? I'd love to know your thoughts. Jump down in the comment section below and let me know what you guys think. All right. Adam K writes, just saw Punch Drunk Glove. Adam Sandler is great. See, I was just mentioning, and Punch Drunk Glove isn't just straight drama, but there's a lot of dramatic acting in that. And I think Adam Sandler's tremendous talent when it comes to dramatic acting. I, again, I bring up this movie all the time. If you want to see just how good of an actor Adam Sandler is, watch this movie he did called Rain Over Me. It is without doubt my favorite Adam Sandler movie and his performance. And I argued not to win, but I argued he should have got, he, he really should have gotten an Academy Award nomination for that. I thought he was tremendous in it. It really showed a side of him that not a lot of people had seen up to that point, And I think he's great in it. But Punch Dark Love is also fantastic. All right. Robin Peterson writes, no, you beat me to my history fact. Oh, oh, so you wrote that in before I brought up the stuff about it being the Oscars birthday this morning on the show. I'm sorry about that, Robin. I'll, I'll try to take a peek at that later next time. Uh, Run Amuck Design writes, uh, Voodoo launched a great service allowing us to scan the barcodes of movies, of movie DVDs we already own and convert to digital for $2. I've done over, really? That's awesome. 
And I'll tell you why that's awesome on a couple of levels. Number one, for those of you who have collected tons and tons and tons of DVDs and Blu-rays, whatever, over the year, over the years, now you've got a secure thing, so you don't have to worry about those discs getting scratched, getting damaged, getting lost, getting borrowed, and then forgetting about it. That's great. The second great thing about that is that you can now continue, if you're somebody who loves physical media, you can now continue to buy and collect physical media, not worrying about that physical media is going away eventually because now you have a mechanism that you can still get your digital copy. I don't know the details of that. I'm just reading this for the first time, but if that's true, man, that is a great service for two bucks. Totally worth it. Thanks for sharing that Ron Muck design. I got to take a peek at that. Uh, Cause I still got some DVDs that I don't own digitally. So maybe I can figure out a way to spend a couple of bucks and get my digital copies of them. All right. Jason Dolan writes, just drove uh, Atlanta to LA listening to you all the way. Well, thanks a lot for that, man. I hope you had a good, that's a long freaking trip, dude. Atlanta to LA is a long, I thought it was a long flight. That's a long drive, man. I hope, I hope you're not sick of my voice by now because my wife gets sick of my voice that long. If I was, she was in a car with me that long, she'd get sick of my voice. Uh, Dill Pickle writes, hey, John, I love your show. Thank you so much, man. You, Rob, and Ashley are amazing. Thanks for making my two-hour bus ride to school interesting. Oh, my God, a two-hour bus ride to school? Dude, that's rough. But, hey, man, I'm glad we're able to be there with you, hang out with you as film fans, talking about movies, all that kind of stuff. Thanks for being a part of our show, man, and thanks for letting us be a part of your day. I appreciate that, man. And whatever can make that bus ride go faster, you do it, man. All right. DC writes, what did you think about the season finale for Flash? I'm kind of disappointed with some stuff in the season, mainly with the handling of thought. I'll tell you what, last seasons of Fla the last season of Flash uh, with DeVoe, I was very disappointed. I didn't like the season at all. They did a couple of good things in it, but I didn't like the season at all. I thought this season was a significant step back up. And I like the finale. Am I jumping up and down over it? No. Do I think Cisco's decision and choice makes any sense at all? Not at all. That What he chose and decided to do makes absolutely no sense at all. Uh, I didn't think they set that up properly. Uh, although they did talk about it earlier in the season, but it, even then earlier in the season, it made no logical sense to me. The Thawne stuff I liked. I liked that it all came down to Thawne's big overall plan. I thought they did that very well, actually. So is this, do I think this was the best season of Flash or the best season finale? No. Was I satisfied as a fan with it? I was. Yeah, I th I certainly a lot more than I was last year at any rate. Uh, thanks for asking, DC. All right. Jason Dolan writes, Breaking Bad did the same thing Game of Thrones did. Two short seasons, but called it season five, part one and season five, part two. Maybe HBO should have done this strategy. I, it's not so much that they shortened the seasons. It was they shortened the seasons when those seasons really needed to be full seasons. You know, the stuff with the Breaking Bad final season was, <clears throat> it didn't feel, now personally, I like the final season of Game of Thrones more than I like the uh, Breaking Bad final season. I do. But I never once at all felt like anything in the final season of Breaking Bad felt rushed. I never once felt that. I felt it was just high quality, good, steady, never rushed, paced all, all through. This one, while I think the, the results have been extremely great, I do, I have felt the rushness of it though. I, I have sensed that at the same time. And it's not a matter of whether you call it season one or season two, or part, part season A, part season B, whatever. It's just that going into these last two seasons, knowing they were wrapping up the story, they needed more than 13 episodes. <clears throat> and that is what the final two seasons were, 13 episodes. So we'll see. And by the way, guys, tomorrow afternoon, we're going to do our final Game of Thrones prediction live chat. Make sure you guys join us for that. We're going to talk about you know, our last chance going into the final episode of Game of Thrones ever. We're going to be giving our predictions, stuff like that. I'm going to want to hear from you guys, so just keep that in mind. That's going to be later tomorrow. All right, Brandon York writes, Hey, John, did you ever get the chance to check out the Canadian show Letter Kenny on Hulu? Some of the writing, some of the wittiest writing I've ever seen in a TV show. I have not, to be honest with you. I've never checked that out. Hopefully at some point I'll get a chance to do that because I know that was brought up to me once before. Maybe it was you, Brandon. Maybe it was somebody else. But I still haven't had a chance to see it. But I love getting recommendations from you guys. By the way, one of my favorite shows that I'm watching right now, 
Doom Patrol, is a show I had no desire to watch. But you guys kept telling me to check it out, so I finally caved in and I checked it out, and now I love this show. So I hopefully I will get a chance to get around to checking this out at some point, Brandon. Thanks for sharing it. All right. Frank Van Wonder, who's in rights. It's time to butcher my name again. I probably just butchered it again. I probably just butchered it again because that's what I do. Um, uh, under over 40%, we will see a Spidey versus Sinister Six in the upcoming two phases of the MCU. Most difficult is, is juggle a bigger cast. That's not a big deal. Every cast has tons of characters in it. It's just that we don't all recognize the names of all the characters. It's really not a big deal. I don't know, though, because... First of all, that means you'd have to get six big villains that Sony doesn't want to use in their cinematic universe. And I don't know that you can pull off. I don't know that you can pull that off. So you know what? I'm not going to say it's a, it's impossible. I'd even say it's higher than 10%. I think 40% is a little high though. So I'm going to take the under on that. I'm going to take the under. The biggest obstacle is not the size of the cast. That's easy. That's nothing. The big difficulty is, can you get a true Sinister Six that are made up of all characters that Sony doesn't want to use? And I, I don't know that that's the case, so we'll have to see. All right. Uh, Jerry Mannion writes, uh, Star Trek Picard show for Amazon Prime. Thoughts? I think it's great. Now, remember, really, the show is for CBS All Access. It's just outside of the U.S., in a lot of markets, it'll be on Amazon Prime, as opposed to Netflix, which is what they license uh, Star Trek Discovery out to. <clears throat> I thought that was very interesting. Like, you would just assume that if you're putting Star Trek Discovery on Netflix for international markets, then you would put Star Trek Picard on there for international markets as well. But they didn't do that. I guess Amazon made the better offer, and it's going to be there. So, I mean, obviously, I live in the U.S., so I'm just going to watch it on CBS All Access like everybody else here. But uh, it's pretty cool that it's going around. Again, Netflix now has solid competition. You know, we talked on the show today about how CW is no longer just going to automatically put their shows on Netflix. Now they're going to let other streaming services bid on it. It's it's a changing landscape, man. It's a changing landscape. But I'm very excited about the show, very much. Uh, Michael Bradley writes, just finished Star Trek Discovery. It is so good. I agree. I think it's great. Now, Rob and I disagree on this one. And, and to be fair, Rob is a much bigger Star Trek fan than I am. And he really doesn't like Star Trek Discovery. I love it. I'm kind of bummed out that the season's over, actually. I Now, do I think it does everything perfectly? No, I, I take some issues with some things they do. I never liked the time crystal thing they did at all. But overall, I love the show. Can't wait to see it next season. And I hope that Captain Pike and the Enterprise crew get their own spinoff because I was getting really invested in that a lot. So I hope they do that. Uh, Mess Q on Club writes... Uh, what do you think about Doom Patrol? It's funny, I was just talking about Doom Patrol. What do you think about Doom Patrol, and how good is it compared to the CW shows? I love Doom Patrol. I'm not going to compare it to anything else, because um, that's not fair. There are shows on CW that I'm a, meh, mediocre on. Some shows on CW I really love, like Flash, uh, Black Lightning, and everything. All I can say is that I love Doom Patrol. I'm having such a good time. It's so creative, so inventive, so different. I've never seen anything quite like it. It dives into incredibly mature themes um, and just the stuff they tackle from mental illness to um, tragedy to, I mean, deep moral dilemmas to incredibly weird. Like the whole idea that Mr. Nobody is the big, it's crazy. I love this show. I'm adoring it. Again, it was a show I wasn't even going to watch until you guys convinced me to do it, which I'm so glad that you did. FN1189 writes, with the recent Game of Thrones backlash, fans are now pissed about uh, uh, D&D helming the next Star Wars. Thoughts? Idiotic. Uh, it's not idiotic to not like this season of Game of Thrones. If you don't like this season of Game of Thrones, you don't like it. It's all subjective. Nothing wrong with that. But, and Rob and I talked about this on the show a little bit today, too. These guys created, made, and show ran the most iconic television show for eight years, the most talked about show, the most pop culturally dominant show of the past eight years. And because some people don't like, because they're doing things to end up the show that other people don't like, they're going, oh, the whole thing sucks. They I can't, don't want to see what they, that's stupid to me. It's cool if you don't like this season of Game of Thrones, that's fine. I just think more people need to be like Rob, where like Rob doesn't like this season of Game of Thrones either. 
I we debate it all the time. I love it. Rob doesn't like it. But Rob's like, oh, but these guys are tremendously talented. I can't wait to see what they do with Star Wars. Uh, the whole thing, th I mean, seriously, fandom has become so entitled. It's crazy. And how fast we turn on a dime. It's seriously the most successful, iconic, epic show, maybe of all time, for eight years. But we don't like what they've done in the past year. No, I don't want them doing Star Wars. Th that's idiotic to me. To me, that's purely idiotic. Uh, so I don't get that, like whatsoever. Now, fortunately, most of my friends, of the of my friends who don't like Game of Thrones this season, they're all like, oh, but oh my God, yeah, I love what they've done with this show overall. That's why I'm so invested in the shows because what they've done. So I cannot wait to see what they do with Star Wars. That's a more level-headed approach. Doesn't mean they'll do a good job with Star Wars. Steven Spielberg made bad stuff. Maybe they'll make bad stuff too. But not liking one season or season of a half of a show that's been on for almost nine years now that you've loved previously, it's, it's just stupid to go, I don't want them doing so. I don't get that, but whatever. Hey, it is what it is. And again, that's no shade on anybody for not liking this season. I've got friends who don't like this season. It's all subjective. If you watch it and it didn't work for you, it didn't work for you. It works a lot for me, but it doesn't work for some other people and that's cool. But now look, if you've hated Game of Thrones since day one, that's different. And like, if you've hated Game of Thrones since day one, then I would totally get somebody being like, I don't want these guys anywhere near Star Wars. That I understand. That I can get behind and that I can wrap my head around. But like being in love with the film for six or being in love with the show for six solid years, it's the same guys, by the way. And now it's because you didn't like what they've done to wrap up a couple of stories, which I think is brilliant, but maybe it's not what you would have done. Fine. To then go, oh, I don't want them making a movie. I don't get that at all. But again, if you've hated this show for a long time and never thought it was any good, then I totally get it. Then why would you want them making one of your favorite film franchises next movies? That I get. That I get. But this whole thing recently is just kind of, it really does show you how toxic and how entitled fandom has become today. It, it really, really does. Anyway, Raymond G writes, uh, Rob, uh, why do Rob and others want Galactus? Doesn't work. One, not evil, just hungry. Two, more of a force of nature, uh, not someone you can fight without looking silly. The, uh, the first two things, look, your antagonist doesn't have to be evil. Remember that. The antagonist of a film doesn't have to be evil. Take Castaway, for example. The antagonist doesn't even have to be a character. The antagonist in Castaway, the Tom Hanks film, was nature. That was the antagonist. Sometimes environment is the antagonist. And quite oftentimes, the antagonist is not evil. So whatever Galactus' motivations are, if he's the thing working against your hero, like Galactus is going to end the Earth, he doesn't have to be evil for that to be the antagonist and you got to stop that. So that's fine. Uh, more of a force of nature. Again, nature itself is often the antagonist. Look at The Perfect Storm with uh, George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg. There's no evil in that movie, but a force of nature is the antagonist. So you can do that. That's, that's fine. It's the third part that I'm totally behind. I don't get how you do a Galactus. What are you, you going to do? Is the thing going to go up and punch Galactus in the nose? I, I don't know how you do that and make it satisfying or compelling at all. I, I don't know how you do that on the big screen. I think it works great in a cartoon, works great on a comic book page. I don't think it works in a movie. I don't think it works particularly a live action movie. But who knows, right? I never thought a Lego movie made about plastic building blocks could be any good, and that turned out to be great. So maybe Galactus can too. We'll have to wait and see, I guess. Uh, Jason Dolan writes, uh, just in George R. R. Mountain will remake season eight of Game of Thrones in print form. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. That's clever, Jason. Um, Tristan uh, Lucky writes, what happened to the Raid remake? Um, they're still making it. Joe Carnahan actually just talked a month or two ago about how they're still developing it. It's still coming. So as far as I, but look, oftentimes these movies take years to digest and and to come together and to form. And it's sometimes it's quick, but a lot of times it takes years and years and years to get it all going. But he just talked recently about the fact that they're still developing it. So as far as I know, it's still on the books. It's still coming. Doshi writes, Ric Flair, I heard about this. Ric Flair rushed to hospital, serious condition. Yeah, I read a report on this, uh, the Nature Boy Ric Flair. Woo! 
was rushed to hospital with a serious health issue. That's all they talked about. I didn't see any more details on that. Maybe more have come out and I just haven't seen them yet, but they are calling it a serious health condition, a health situation. So uh, thoughts and prayers to Ric Flair. The dude's just 70. He's still young, man. He's just 70 years old. So fingers crossed for Ric Flair at this point. Santez Henderson writes, am I the only person who has a crush on uh, Issa Fisher? Nope. I developed a, a crush on her just from the wedding crashers. But she was also, I was talking today too about that movie Tag with Jeremy Renner and John Hamm and, uh, uh, oh, Ed Helms, uh, Ed, Ed, Ed Helms, I almost called Ed Helmsworth. Ed Helms. I love that movie. Fisher's in that too. She's great in it. I like her a lot. I like her a lot. You're not the only one. I mean, she's not my overall celebrity crush, but love seeing her in movies. I think she's tremendously funny and talented and beautiful, and I think she's great. Uh, Joseph Sordi writes, speaking of Bond, what do you think is the most absurd Bond villain death? Mine is Hugo Drax ejected into space. I was actually going to go to that. As soon as I started reading your question, I was going to go to that. Um, every villain has their own unique way of going in all these types of movies, but the injected into space one... That's the one I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with you on that one, Joseph. So good pick. Um, Rickiest Ricky. I like that name. Hi, guys. Fan of the show. Thank you so much, Rickiest. Uh, just got a Blu-ray copy of John Wick last night. However, my digital copy code expired. Hella bum. Thoughts about that. Wait a minute. You just bought it and it expired? Did, I, I can only assume you must have bought it secondhand. Because how could have it expired if you just bought it? Unless it's a copy that's been sitting on the shelf for three years. And now you just got an expired that that would kind of suck if you bought it from a store i would go back to the store and let them know hey i bought this here partly because of the digital copy thing but the thing on it is expired maybe they'll refund you maybe they'll give you a little bit of a discount i don't know if you bought it second hand though well then there's nothing you can do but what i would say is if you bought it from a store go back to the store say you sold me something that was um that's expired because part of this package is the digital copy. You sold me a copy with an expired digital code. Either give me another code or refund me or, or something. You might be able to, to get something on that, Ricky. That's what I would do at any rate if I were in your shoes. All right. Seb Marvel writes, what movie do you think will be the highest grossing movie this summer? Uh, well, hold on a second. When do, what's the, I can't remember off the top of my head. Hold on a second. Uh, uh, oh, Lion King. I think Lion King will be the highest one this summer. There was a time before I realized that Endgame was going to make over $2.5 billion. There was a time that I thought Lion King had a chance of being maybe the number one box office film of the year. Now, I always said Endgame will be the number one box office, but I think Lion King has a chance. I think Lion, Lion King has a chance. I don't think it has a chance anymore, but for a time I thought maybe it had a chance. I think it'll be end up, uh, now this is all providing that the movie's good. If the movie's not all that good, well then all bets are off. But if it's as good as say Jungle Book is, then I think it's gonna be the number one uh, box office movie this summer. That's kind of my thought. All right, and I believe the final question today comes to us from Finn Barrett who writes, uh, JW3 left me smiling for two hours. My dad fell asleep. John Wick 3. Guys, please don't use abbreviations when you write in because I almost, I almost was Jurassic World 3. There is. Okay. John Wick 3. Guys, please don't use abbreviations. Please write in the name of the movie if you're doing it so that I don't have to guess about it. Uh, I can't wait. It's opening day, folks. It's time for all of us to dip our wick. I'm going to go out and see me and Ann and Ray and our buddy Ryan uh, are going to go see a 745 show tonight of John Wick. I'm very excited. I cannot wait to see this thing. I'm jumping out of my skin for it. So pretty much when I'm done here, I'm going to go get ready and we're going to go off, have dinner and then go watch the movie. I'm so stoked about that. I know Rob is probably on his way to the theater right now. He's going to go see John Wick at a 7 p.m. screening. So excited. Cannot wait to see it, Finn. I'm glad you liked it. I'm sorry your dad fell asleep in it. All right, guys. That will do it for this installment of Companion Videos. We're now all caught up to date. Don't forget, guys, the John Campus Show will be back again tomorrow. Come on over, leave your comments and thoughts on that as well, and we can't wait to have you there. That'll do it for us for now, guys. My name's John Campion, and until our next video, bye-bye.